understanding the days of judgment is imperative as we look to the heavens in confident anticipation of our deliverance from the oppression of the wicked. Throughout scripture, we find many references where the Most High brought judgment on the inhabitants of the world. Now we see end time signs happening on the earth, and we also will see it happening in the heavens. As a result, we need to guard our hearts and minds against deceptive signs. In the last session, we looked at the prophecy about the last day signs in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Messiah was responding to questions the disciples asked him after he told them that the temple would be destroyed. They wanted to know when the temple would be destroyed, what would be the sign of his coming, and the end of the age. So let's dig a little deeper into the second question. What would be the sign of his coming? One thing that has to happen is that the times of the Gentiles would come to an end. And we can certainly see that happening now. And it's happening at an alarming rate. Watch this. Glenn Beck, thank you so much for coming on tonight. How, how, how thank you. It's, would you it's interpret kind of you this? To say. Well, it's true. So let me, I, I've got a couple of things here for you. Um, let me just go through. I'm going to bring, a, I think, a different perspective to this. We have the banking crisis. They say it's fine. It's just beginning. We, um, yesterday, we had the Saudis and uh, Brazil and um, uh, China enter a deal to where the petrodollar is over. Brazil and China are going to uh, trade in their own currency. That's the beginning of the end of our currency. That means a dollar collapse. That yes. means we become Venezuela. We will have war with China. We will have war with Russia and Iran. Uh, we have the restrict bill. We have social media and our NSA and everybody else in bed with each other, silencing people. We, of course, have the raccoon dogs, which we all know is bull crap. Um, and now this week, we have a new uh, gun grab that they're trying to do. Um, Biden and his family taking money from the Chinese. What do you think this Donald Trump thing is really all about? The, American, the America that we knew, the fundamental transformation that started in 2008 is finished. We are no longer viewed as a superpower. We are now a, an elderly, what, we're Joe Biden, just walking into the twilight. The why Canadians are warning about the collapse of American democracy. You know, Tuck, Tucker Carlson, Fox so-called news, right-wing billionaires, a bought off Supreme Court, polluting industries, and the politicians they all own not to mention a, uh, a widespread, you could call it a gun culture, I'd say it's just you know marketing by the gun industry, have screwed up America so badly that Canada, Canada for God's sake, Canada is worrying about us. Seriously, Vincent Rigby was the national security and intelligence advisor to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau up until about eight months ago. And now he's joined a top shelf group of national security experts in Canada to warn the entire country. And he's warning them about us, about the United States. This is a new report. It was prepared both for the Canadian public and the national security and police officials across the country and parliament. Rigby and his colleagues argue that if a Donald Trump type candidate, whether it's Trump himself or DeSantis or one of the other uh, Trump humpers who are, you know, high on fascism. If one of them becomes president of the United States in, in two and a half years, in 2024, all bets are off. The co-director, along with Vincent Rigby, of this task force, and also an associate professor at the School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa, told the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, this should just chill you. He said, when we think about threats, this is Canadians talking to Canadians. When we think about threats to Canada, we usually think about the Soviet military threat. We think about Al-Qaeda. We think about the rise of China. We think about the war in Ukraine. 
all these things are true, of course, but so is the rising threat to Canada that the U.S. possesses. That's completely new. That calls for a new way of thinking and a new way of managing our relationship with the United States, end quote. This is Richard Wolf from Democracy at Work responding to another Ask Prof. Wolf question from our Patreon community. And this one comes from David. And again, I've chosen it from the questions you've been sending because a number of you have asked similar questions. It's about the dollar, the U.S. dollar. And it's about whether the dollar is losing its primacy in the world. And more importantly, if it is, because it is, what are the implications? What does it mean for the United States? Will there be a collapse? What are the other consequences? Very important question. So let me begin by assuring you that yes, the dollar is losing its primacy. There really is no question about this. The disagreement is how fast this process is going and will go, not about whether. Now there is no denying that a shift is happening in the earth and these changes are not without violence. Watch the next two clips. for the third night in a row, with police making dozens of arrests. Earlier in the day, activists posting videos of protesters storming through a major shopping center. And throughout France, clashes with police. Last night in Lyon, protesters ransacked the town hall, smashing storefront windows. Police are trying to block off streets to try and corral the crowd, but you can already see dumpster fires already happening, debris all in the grass here, and you can still smell that there's tear gas in the air. Now, why don't they ever refer to them as thugs when they protest and destroy things? What this is telling us is that democracy has essentially failed. Not only that, those who built powerful empires through exploitation, rape, murder, theft, and the enslavement of others see those empires crumbling. The Gentiles see the handwriting on the wall. And as I said in the live this past Wednesday, when they realize that their world is falling apart, they look for the common enemy. Now let's bring in Joel 3 again to see if there are additional details that we should be paying attention to in these last days. I'm reading it from the Septuagint and we're looking at Joel 3. It says, for behold, in those days and at that time, in what days and at what time? Well, if you're following along in your Bible and look at verse 14, you will see that it is referring to what is called the day of the Lord. It's really a day of the Most High's wrath against a certain group of people. But a lot of Christians equate this day with the rapture. So back to verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall have turned the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So we know that this is a last day prophecy or end of time, end of days prophecy, I should say. It says, when I shall have turned the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So let's pause here and take another look at Luke 21. 
I want to read verses 20 through 22. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea, the Judeans, flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her, speaking of Jerusalem, depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So we're confirming that this is talking about the event that was to happen after the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. We're also confirming that this is happening to the house of Judah and Jerusalem. So the tribes are Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. They make up the house of Judah. They were told to flee, as in to get away from Judea and leave Jerusalem because judgment would be coming to the land and the people who remained. Let's look at what Josephus said concerning that event. This is coming from Cambridge Bible for Schools and Colleges. It says, The Days of Vengeance will refer to Daniel 9:26 through 27. So it says, Josephus again and again calls attention to the abnormal wickedness of the Jews or the Yehudis as the cause of the divine retribution which overtook them. In his wars of the Jews, he declares that no generation and no city was so plunged in misery since the foundation of the world. Now let's go back to Luke. We're looking at verses 23 through 24. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people, the house of Judah. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. So the wrath of the Most High went or came upon the house of Judah because they did not recognize the day of their visitation. They didn't acknowledge Messiah and they called for him to be put to death. Now we know that many of them did believe and they became his disciples and followers of the way. The people Messiah warned are those who are his followers. He warns them to get out of the land when they saw the signs. That is definitely the Most High's mercy at work there. But even though they escaped the sword, the descendants of those who escaped still had to endure the wrath of the judgment that came. And many were taken into captivity and scattered to the four corners. They were led into captivity and forced to serve Gentile nations. So we're still waiting to see some pictures of those who say that they are us being led into captivity anywhere. I encourage you to do a Google search and see what you come up with. See what the pictures show. If you find pictures of them, more than likely it will be between 1933 and 1945. But you won't see them being scattered into all nations. Those are facts. So it tells us Jerusalem would be trampled by Gentiles, another race of people would be living in the land. When? In the last days. We're talking about a last day prophecy, right? Let's go back to Joel 3. We're looking at verse 2. It says, I will also gather all the Gentiles and bring them down to the valley of Josaphat here. In, the, in other verses, it says Jehoshaphat. 
and will plead with them there for my people, my heritage, Israel, who have been dispersed among the Gentiles, and these Gentiles have divided my land. I want us to take a look at that word plead, because some may think it's talking about begging. Let's look at this. This comes from BibleStudyTools.com. I want to make sure we understand what it says when we use that word plead there. So plead in modern non-legal English is a synonym of pray or beseech. But in legal phraseology, plea, plead, and pleading have a great variety of technical meanings with present a case before the court as the idea common to all. All the uses of plead in English versions of the Bible are connected with this legal sense so that outside of the set phrase plead a cause, there is hardly a use of the word in the King James Version. The English Revised Version or the American Standard Revised Version that is clear modern English, the most obscure instances are due to the King James Version's employment of plead to translate the nafal or shafa, shafat. Shafat means judge. So it's nafal means bring oneself into a case to be judged. He's bringing them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat to be judged. It says enter into controversy with and so plead in the legal sense. So I hope you're understanding this. So it says accordingly, when Yah is said to plead with man, as in Isaiah 66:16, the meaning is that he states his side of the case and not at all that he supplicates man to repent. This is a judicial act. <laughs> now let's look at Webster's Dictionary for plead, to argue a case or cause in a court of law, to make an allegation in an action or other legal proceeding, to conduct pleadings, to argue for or against a claim, to entreat or appeal earnestly. In verses 3 through 7 of Joel 3, the Most High is presenting the case against the nations involved with dividing his land, stealing things from his temple, and selling his people into slavery. This would include the mistreatment of them. But European nations think he's going to just let all of it go just because time has passed. Oh, well, that happened a long time ago. So let's just forget about it and move on. If the Most High didn't forget about it and he's not letting it go, why should we? Here's what you need to see. The judgment has already been pronounced. Let's read verse 7. Therefore, Behold, I will raise them up out of the place where you have sold them, and I will return your recompense on your own heads. He's talking about the regathering. This is the regathering. But he's talking about regathering the descendants of those who were taken into captivity. We're talking about the tribe of Judah, Benjamin, and some of the Levites. They removed us far from our borders. This has nothing to do with the church. 
the the chapter is telling you who he's talking about the church was not taken into captivity and sold to the four corners so how could the day of the lord be about the rapture of the church let's look at verse 8 and i will sell your sons and your daughters into the hands of the children of judah and they shall sell them into captivity to a far distant nation so the punishment is that those nations will reap what they have sown and you always reap more than what you've sown now i want to read this commentary from cal and delish because most theologians when they focus on the captivity of the house of judah they only look at the old testament and then they say oh well that has already happened and they ignore the prophecy that messiah gave in luke 21. so it says in joel 3 2 and joel 3 3 joel is speaking not of events belonging to his own time or to the most recent past but of that dispersion of the whole of the ancient covenant nation among the heathen which was only completely affected on the conquest of palestine and destruction of jerusalem by the romans and which continues to this day did you catch that though we cannot agree with Hengisberg, this person he's uh, commenting about that this furnishes an argument in favor of the allegorical interpretation of the army of locusts in chapters one and two for since moses had already foretold that israel would one day be driven out among the heathen and he's referencing leviticus 26 and deuteronomy 28. joel might assume that this judgment was a truth well known in israel even though he had not expressed it in his threatening of punishment in chapters 1 and 2. so he's telling us that this captivity was a future event it's the event messiah is prophesying about in luke 21 so i'll drop down it says the prisoners of war are distributed by lot among the conquerors and disposed of by them to slave dealers at most ridiculous prices a boy for a harlot a girl for a drink of wine even in joel's time many israelites may no doubt have been scattered about in distant heathen lands but the heathen nations had not yet cast lots upon the nation as a whole to dispose of the inhabitants as slaves and divide the land among themselves this was not done till the time of the romans so family i need you to make sure that you understand these prophecies because if you listen to the theologians they're only going to talk about the captivities of the house of israel or the house of judah that's mentioned in the old testament and they completely ignore luke so they knew that this was to be a global captivity that occurred after the death burial and resurrection of messiah why is it that no one talks about this captivity now let's look at some confirming words from the book of ezekiel 37 15 through 20 that ties in directly to joel 3 again the word of the most high came to me saying as for you son of man take a stick for yourself and write on it for judah and for the children of israel his companions then take another stick and write on it for joseph the stick of ephraim and for all the house of israel his companions then join them one to another for yourself into one stick 
and they will become one in your hand and when the children of your people speak to you saying will you not show us what you mean by these say to them thus says the most high surely i will take the stick of joseph which is in the hand of ephraim and the tribes of israel his companions and i will join them with it with the stick of judah and make them one stick and they will be one in my hand and the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes let's go on now we're still looking at ezekiel we're looking at verses 21 through 23 then say to them thus says the most high surely i will take the children of israel from among the nations this is telling us that the entire nation is away from the land they are not living in the land or they're not in their rightful place where are they they are living among the nations he says wherever they have gone he's going to take the children from among the nations wherever they have gone and will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land now they want us to believe that this happened over 70 years ago a little over 70 years ago but listen to what he says i will make them one nation in the land so if you listen to the people who say they are us what do they call themselves and when you ask them where are the other tribes they can't tell you i will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of israel and one king shall be king over them all they shall no longer be two nations nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again they shall not defile themselves any more with their idols nor with their detestable things nor with any of their transgressions but i will deliver them from all their dwelling places wherever they are living their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them then they shall be my people and i will be their most high so if we look at the signs that were listed in matthew 24 and luke 21 we see that messiah identified those signs that were only the beginning of birth pangs it's the beginning of the tribulation period for his people so things he said to look for wars and rumors of wars disturbances nation fighting against nation famine earthquakes persecution the gospel being preached to the world lawlessness the destruction of jerusalem the house of judah taken into captivity great tribulation or great distress happening false christs and prophets appearing to deceive people so he told us that these things are only the beginning not that these things listed wouldn't continue the reason he equates it with a woman in labor is because they get increasingly worse now let's confirm that we're going to look at matthew 24 4 through 8 messiah is speaking to the disciples and he says to them take heed that no one deceives you for many will come in my name saying i am the christ and will deceive many you will hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not troubled why because all these things must come to pass but he says the end is not yet so they were not living in the time when they would see all these things we're the generation that's seeing all of these things he says for a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines pestilences and earthquakes in various places look at verse 8 
all these are the beginning of sorrows. He also then lists the signs that would happen immediately after those days. We're in a period now where we see the transition, the, the transitioning phase, where we're seeing the end of one and the beginning of the other. So these are the signs that we will begin to see appearing as we're looking at those other signs that he mentioned. So signs in the sun and moon and stars, powers of the heavens will be shaken, dismay or distress among nations, men fainting from fear of what is coming. They're fainting from fear because they know what's coming. Then the Son of Man appears and angels gather the elect from the nations. So our tribulation ends and the judgment for those nations that afflicted us begins. Now, if you think about what's going on in the world right now and you reference the videos that you saw at the beginning, you can clearly see that the times of the Gentiles are coming to an end and they know it. So let's take a look at this chart so that we can understand these various judgments that are still to come. So the first one is what Gentiles refer to as the day of the Lord. Some even call it the rapture. They think this is the rapture. But who's going to experience judgment here it will be those nations that enslaved his people, divided the land and removed things from the temple. All of the nations of the world did not participate in that. When is this going to happen? At the regathering of the nation of Israel when they are restored to their rightful place. What's the verdict? Well, those who participated in it are going to reap the same things they have sown. They will be taken into captivity. Their children will be sold. So the next judgment we want to look at is what's referred to as the great white throne judgment. This is for unbelievers, all unbelievers. And you can reference 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12 and Revelations 20. They will all be judged, those who did not believe the truth but they took pleasure in wickedness. This happens after the millennium. Now, just so you know, the word millennium does not appear in scripture, but words that mean millennium appear. So theologians talk about the 1000 year reign as the millennium. So I use it here to make it easier for you to differentiate between the times. What's the verdict? for unbelievers, eternal condemnation. And then there's the judgment seat. Some refer it to the mercy seat. This is for believers or saints appear here. Based on Romans 14, 10 through 12 and other verses of scripture, we are, we appear and your works will be judged. This happens at the return of Messiah and you are given rewards based on your works. Rewards are given or withheld based on what you have done. It is extremely important for us to be able to differentiate between the times because Messiah gave us a warning. In Matthew 24, and we're looking at verses 42 through 44, he told us to watch because we would not know the hour of his coming. And this is why he told us to pay attention to these signs because these Gentile nations are paying attention to what's happening with us. They see that we're waking up in greater numbers and they see how their nations are collapsing. 
So he said, if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. So he says, be ready because he's coming at an hour you do not expect. What does that tell you? It will be very difficult to pinpoint the exact hour. So you have to remain in a state of watchfulness. You're reading and studying the word and looking at the prophecies. And then you're also looking at these signs to see how things are unfolding in the earth. But as I said, the enemy is paying attention to these prophecies as well in order to deceive and confuse. They will present their false Messiah when they think it's time for the real one to appear. Because he told us false Christ will perform great signs and miracles and deceive many. Let's look at this next scripture. This is coming from Mark 13, 22. For a false Christ and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. I want to read that again so that you don't miss this last part. They're showing signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So this is telling us that the elect will not be deceived. How do we prevent deception? We need the word. If we know truth, then we won't fall for the lies and the deceptions. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. So we need to prepare our hearts now. The time to be ready is not the time to get ready. You should be fasting, praying, studying, meditating on the word, spending time in Yah's presence. I had an interesting dream the other night that I want to share with you that will drive home this point. I was in a house, it's a really big house with a lot of people in there. And they all looked terrified. There were also a lot of people outside of the house. So I went outside and it was dusk. There was very little light left. But I saw two men and these two men were shrieking. I mean, just yelling as if they were in great pain. And I don't know if you remember the movie, The Green Mile. But if you did, then you remember the part where John Coffey would heal someone and it was as though he would take in their disease and then release it. And what came out of his mouth looked like black particles or something. Well, that's what started coming out of the mouths of these two men. And then their bodies began to disintegrate into whatever this black gunk was. So I went back into the house and you could tell that the people inside knew that awful things were happening outside. You could see the fear in their eyes. But I saw two men sitting on a bench and they were fearful as well. And they were clutching a book to their chest as in they were holding on for a dear life. They look like two older black men. And I want to share, I wanted to share that with you because the only way to escape what's coming is to be in the right place, in the safety of the Father's house. And you have to hold on to his word. You have to get it in your heart so that you can recognize truth. It's the truth that you know that will make you free. So we're going to continue with this next time. I have more to share about this. But if this message has been a blessing to you, please hit the like 
share it, and you're welcome to subscribe if you have not already done so. Join me next time. Be blessed, family.